today is industry day. And today is when we have those real conversations about where the rubber really hits the road. And the trust is here to deliver this presentation from idea to impact, a blueprint on accelerating human development. And we really have a subtopic um, to this. And quite interestingly, Dr. Amande, I noticed that after this, um, there'll be a discussion on the skills gap. And so that's brilliant because our subtopic to this discussion is bridging the skills gap connecting teaching and learning to workforce needs. And so it is my pleasure to share with Dwayne Bent. I love Dwayne Bent dearly, and everybody knows that, right? And he will be with me this morning, and we're going to hear some real high-level discussions on what the trust is doing and how we're going to be moving the Jamaican workforce and really making even more of an impact this time around at our 40th birthday. And so I begin, and I've been saying it ever since, that we cannot continue to undermine TVET because that is where the power lies. If TVET is constrained, we are dealing with a human constraint. If TVET is constrained, we are dealing with a financial constraint. If TVET is constrained, we are dealing with an economic constraint and essentially a world constraining issue. And so we cannot afford to constrain this particular discussion today. Neither can we, af can we afford to not put in the systems and structures in place to advance TVET excellence. So at heart, we are about human development, and we're very specific to removing the capital because it's, a two, two, it's two different things, right? We're about human development, right? And that is removing that constraint from humans. Human development is defined as the process of enlarging people's freedoms and opportunities and improving their well-being. Human development is about the real freedom ordinary people have to decide what to be, what to do, and how to live. So if it is that we do not advance Stephen excellence, how can we in any way get to the real issue of human development? And so the discussion begins. As I indicated before, we are going to be looking at the skills gap and how is it that we can close that gap to accelerate human development and what the trust would have been doing over the years to close that gap so that we can accelerate human development. And so by connecting teaching and learning to workforce needs, because really, Prof. Morris, Prof. Hutton, and all these individuals who would have taught me so many things over the years, if it is that education is not geared towards advancing economic excellence and transforming our social lives, then what is the purpose of education? So by connecting teaching and learning to workforce needs, we enable individuals to acquire the necessary skills and knowledge to transform ideas into impactful actions, thereby accelerating human development. So in essence, bridging the skill gap forms a crucial link in the journey from idea to impact, ensuring that individuals are equipped to drive positive change and contribute to nation building. So what is this skills gap business? Why do we need TVET? Why is it important? And what are we trying to solve? What's the big problem that we are trying to solve? So with technological advancement and globalization, the job market has become increasingly competitive. I spoke this morning about the many degrees that we have, but not being able to fulfill the real work that we need to do in the workspace. Employers, frankly, and if we have a group of industry experts in here, they will tell you. I don't know if Mr. Marlon Johnson is here. Employers, he's here, frankly, are struggling to find skilled workers. They're struggling. At the same time, job seekers are finding it difficult to secure well-paying jobs that match their skill set. 
And so the compensation issue arises. These problems have led to the emergence of what we refer to as a skills gap. So the definition really of a skills gap is the difference between the skills possessed by individuals and the skills required by employers to fill vacancies. That is the gap. What I need, you don't have. And however much you would have been prepared, you still don't have it. So there is a disconnect somewhere along the line. And that is why we are saying that TVET cannot be a pathway. Because if it is a pathway, we're going to have that gap. It has to be fully integrated, totally connected. I said this morning, it should be infused at primary, explicit at secondary, and specialized at tertiary. And until we get to that space, we're going to have this mismatch between what the industry needs and what we are putting out. And so, it is also defined as the mismatch between the skills that job seekers possess and those that employers require. And there are different types of skill gaps. We have the hard skills gap the soft skills gap, and the digital skills gap. So we break it down now, and we're going to see what the trust is doing and will do to make the difference. Hard skills are the technical skills that are specific to a particular job, such as programming or engineering. Soft skills, as we all know in this room, refers to the lack of essential skills such as communication, teamwork, problem solving that are necessary for the job. And this is where, Dr. Amonde, we have even most of the problem. Because the individuals are qualified, but then they are not able to be. Because that social peace is missing. Right? And then, of course, we have cases of skills gaps. So what are the, the cases? Skills gaps can be attributed to several factors such as technological advancement. There's a reason that the gap has been created. So with the rapid growth of technology, many jobs require digital literacy, for example, and technological proficiency. However, many workers lack these skills resulting in the skills gap, right? And then audience, we have the demographic shifts, and we cannot refuse to speak about the demographic shifts. We have an aging workforce. We have an aging workforce, and that aging workforce is leaving many positions vacant, and the millennials, and the x geners and the Gen Zs, and all of the things, I don't even know where we reach now with them. There is a challenge because we are not reaching them, right? And so with the aging workforce, it requires a younger generation to possess new skills. And then another um, attributing factor is education and training. So the education system of which I'm part and proud to be part, this is what I know, this is what I've come up in, often fails to keep up with the evolving workforce needs, resulting in a mismatch between job seekers and available jobs. Because we have to reorient the way we look at young people. We can't be afraid of them. We have to welcome them. We have to welcome them and we have to learn from them because there is a real challenge that only they will be able to solve. And so if it is that we do not take them in now, if it is that we keep closing the door on them, referring to their attire, referring to their youthful um, exuberance, and not really using the opportunity to build them up, to put them at the table, to utilize their skills and competencies so that we can really make a difference, we're going to have a problem. Because then we're going to have a huge gig economy. And that is what they're doing. Antigua and Barbuda, because they're saying that we, 
And what we are offering is not appealing enough. And so we have to address that issue. So what is the importance now of bridging the skills gap? Addressing the skills gap is crucial to the economy's growth and the prosperity of individuals. So we can make a decision, you know. We can decide whether we want to arrest the problem now or the problem will arrest us. So we can decide. So to bridge the skills gap, it is essential to connect teaching and learning to workforce needs. And that is what we do at the Heart Trust. This means that educational institutions need to tailor their programs to the requirements of the job market. So the standards bent of the electrician in JPS, the standards that the JPS individuals use to certify or recruit their electricians must be infused in the curriculum in the schools. That is what needs to happen. The standards that we are utilizing at ATL for motor vehicle um, repairs, construction, all of that need to be infused. And so the curriculum cannot be broad-based. It has to be very specific to the different things that are happening in industry. And so that which they're learning in primary school, how does it connect to the actual labor force out there? We do not need to say that, oh, we don't need to go to early childhood. Because if we infuse the standards from early in terms of how industry works, it will be seamless for the young child coming up into the world of work. All right. So there is that. And then we have another strategy, Mr. Marlon, which is to implement apprenticeships, internships, and other work-based learning opportunities that provide students with real-world experience. Prof. Morris, you know, we used to have this thing in school called working experience. Who used to go to the working experience school? You remember those things that we used to call working experience? We're at a particular time in the, in the school, um, in your school life, you are pulled and you go out in industry, go work. Or it's only some of the schools do it, um, 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 Miss Christine. Therein lies the problem. And so we expect now that after you go to pristine school, from grade 7 all the way to 11, and you graduate, you must go in and work and just op operate. You must go to work after fifth form and just operate. How? And then employers complain that these people not work ready. Or you, we said that you're not Monday morning ready. Because the different things, Dr. Amande, that we were supposed to be doing to prepare the individual for work, we take it and we tag it as secondary, second class, only for those who are not capable of learning. As a matter of fact, some individuals will tell you that, you know, they have streams and, 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 and Dr. Gordon is here and I love Dr. Gordon to my heart. Dr. Gordon knows every history and would have been a part of the conceptualization of the heart trust. And I know that this is dear to her heart more than anything else. You will hear that there are some schools and even if they do not exist now in their purest forms, that would have the streams. Anybody remember Dunn's class and Bright class? And you remember done side and bright side. And you remember that with done side, you go a certain route. You do home economics if you're in a dunce class. Don't. And you do sewing. Right? And if you're doing sewing and home economics, everybody look upon you like something like everybody knows that you're not very bright. We know that, right? Doctor Doctor Gordon, dunce class, bright class. And we stratify that throughout and so that child who could have been exposed to the entire curriculum would have been robbed would have been robbed of that opportunity for advancement and so we create again a gap in our economy now dr gardner here they're saying that we have too many lawyers in jamaica and every time you must apply to norman manley anybody in here try to apply to norman manley you can't get in because it's too many because we have this 
feedstock going into that particular area because we would have done so well in constraining the areas that really turn this economy. All right. So the World Economic Forum notes that the world is facing reskilling emergency. That is what is happening. So according to the World Economic Forum, the Future of Jobs Report 2022, an estimated 54% of all employees will require significant reskilling. Listen to this. An estimated 54%, you know, of all employees will require significant reskilling and upskilling by 2025, just two years from now, to meet the demands of the evolving job market. So we're recognizing now that we were doing something wrong and we cannot continue to do it by perpetuating this secondary approach to TVET. So additionally, as jobs are transformed by the technologies of the fourth industrial revolution, we need to reskill more than one billion people by 2030. No audience, if we didn't do it right from morning, can you imagine how far advanced we would have been? So this staggering statistics highlights the urgency and relevance of aligning our educational practices with the skills required by the workforce. Furthermore, studies conducted by the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD, as most of us know it as, consistently emphasize the positive correlation between skill development and economic growth. So we, we, the, the data is there. And, and all our learned academics, we know that it makes no sense to be moving on gut feelings. The data is showing that there is a positive correlation. OECD data shows that countries with well-developed TVET systems and strong connections to industry experience, to industry, sorry, they experience higher productivity rates and lower unemployment rates. Better skills, better jobs, better lives essentially. So why do we need to bridge the skills gap? Skills gap can limit economic growth and competitiveness. We know that as well as job creation and innovation. By 2025, 85 million jobs may be displaced. That's two years from now in a bit. So when you talk about the geomatics and all of that later, we're realizing where we need to go, right? 85 million jobs may be displaced by a shift in the division of labor between human and machines. While 97 million new roles may emerge that are more adapted to the new division of labor between humans, machines, and algorithms. And Bent, you will elaborate on that. This indicates a need for upskilling and reskilling workers to meet the demands of the changing job market. And of course, there is a clear economic imperative to close the skills gap. There is the economic imperative. And what is it, really, that economic imperative to close the skills gap? Another report by the World Economic Forum indicates that bridging the skills gap could add 11.5 trillion, so we're talking about money now, to the global economy by 2028. I will tell you that um, the individuals nowadays were into body en enhancement, right? We, we all want to look like we're not aging. And so we, are, we have a lot of um, emerging, what we'd call them, Miss Christine um, labs in Jamaica now where people are enhancing their bodies so young men you have to really be careful because you may be looking and what you're looking at not really so real you understand so you, you're gonna have to develop a a, a kind of training you know, of the eye to, to ascertain what is real what you call sensory technology right what is real from what is not real because this thing is going on now dr amanda where you will see a, a young lady and you have high blood pressure 
I so why is it that I don't look so? Right? Not recognizing that it is not really so. And then they have now the things called the body shapers. Yes, man. The things that you put on. And when you put them on, everything just fall into place. Right? And I'm telling you, I met one of the young ladies, you know, that is in this industry. Bright young lady. Um, Dr. Gordon used to go to, to um, a school in Portmore. I can't remember the school right now. Bridgeport High. Yes, that's a school that she used to go to, Bridgeport High. And she is into the industry where she makes, she manufactures the body shapers. And this young lady, she write out her tree there, she's making millions of dollars from this thing, Dr. Gordon, right? And this young lady indicated that when she was in school, this particular thing she always wanted to do, and Dr. Gordon, she was in what they call bright class, and they tell her, say, she wanted to go into the classes that would allow her to use her hands, the, the cosmetology and the, 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 the beauty and all of that. And they tell her, no, you're bright. You can't go into the class. Because that class is not for bright people. Right? And she decided that this is what I wanted to do. And she had no problem. She said she didn't graduate because she made up her mind. That they are not taking her where she wants to go, and she wants to go make her body shapers and to go make her wig. And now everybody going up her little place in half a tree, and they're buying them young men, and that is what they are wearing and fooling us. <laughs> right? And so these things we cannot take lightly, and I don't know how many of us in here have on any of them now. <laughs> All right. So. We have to understand that we have to take in the entire human being, and that is what TVET is about. We're not made half, we are whole. We are able to use whatever it is that we have, and we should create the curriculum in such a way that it is easy, that I don't feel stratified, that I don't feel constrained, that if I'm in the space and I'm going there, 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 there is no, there is no obvious kind of an indication that you're not that so you're that this is just where i want to go and that is where we need to get i'm going to wrap up quick so that we can get bent in a survey of 750 business leaders conducted by mckinsey 87 percent reported that they were experiencing or expect to experience skills gap in the workforce so i'm moving on quickly just to the impact the skills gap can have a significant impact on business and the economy. And here are some statistics quickly because I don't know. I can't do the things without the data because otherwise I can't hear. I can't hear if I can't see the numbers and what the research is saying. And that is why we have to understand the TVET ecosystem. Professor Morris is from early childhood all the way up to tertiary. It's the ecosystem that we're looking so lower productivity, according to a report by Deloitte, skills can re reduce productivity by up to 2.5% per year. We can't deal with that kind of a, a deficit. The high turnover rates, a study by the Society for Human Resource Management, SHRM, found that skill shortage were the second most common for employee turnover. That is why Dr. Gordon then can't steal, right? with 56% of employers citing this as a reason. Then we have the increased training cost. Employers may need to invest more in training to bridge the skills gap, and we, we can't afford to be investing in training. If it is that we had done the work, the foundational work, we could be spending less money in this area. And then, of course, we have the reduced competitiveness. So moving on, as TVET practitioners, we have to play a pivotal role in this. The UNESCO UNIVOC International Center highlights innovation, innovative TVET approaches from around the world that effectively bridge the skills gap. And these include industry-led curriculum design. That is where we want the schools to get industry-led curriculum design. Work integrated learning programs, trade school, right? That they used to call us apprenticeship models. I went to Edwin Allen, you know, so I can tell you. I went to Edwin Allen High School. I also went to Glenmuir, but only for sixth form. It's five years I spent at Edwin Allen. 
So I know what I'm talking about because I was at a school that also suffered from the stratification. All right. Then now we, oh, aren't we doing well in champs? Or we didn't win this year? <laughs> we did. <laughs> so by adopting and implementing such practices, we can ensure that our learners acquire the relevant skills and knowledge needed to succeed in the workforce. So let me get quickly to heart, the genesis of heart. And Dr. Gordon is here. She knows the history very well. And as we can see on our screen, we're seeing our prime minister back in the day at Stony Hill. And Stony Hill Heart Academy is still up and running. So the human and employment resource training, um, Human Employment and Resource Training Heart Trust was established in 1982 in the face of significant stress for the Jamaica labor market. Industries and businesses were reeling from the effects of the severe brain drain that resulted from the migration of over 270,000 Jamaicans between 1971 and 1980. And this resulted in employers being hard-pressed to find skilled, competent workers. In 1982, the trust commenced skilled training. And by January 1984, its successes resulted in the opening of Heart's first academy, the Stony Hill Heart Academy. Where are the Stony Hill people? Stony Hill people. All right, you're here, still up and running. So over the years, we would have seen the burgeoning of the reach and the impact of the trust. Today... Since 1982, Dr. Gordon, the trust boasts 26 wholly operated institutions and over 80 community training interventions. The trust also boasts an over 1,100% in increase in graduates since its inception. That is, in 1982, 4,051. In 2022, 46,433. All right, re-energizing Jamaica's economies with skilled laborers. So what is the Heart Trust doing to bridge the skills gap? As the agency entrusted with the mandate for human development in Jamaica, the trust is keen on the importance of bridging the skills gap. This is done by providing training and certification in a wide variety of skill areas to fulfill labor market demand in various industries, such as hospitality. If you have been in the hospitality industry, come on, let me see you. You know that in Jamaica, when you go to the restaurants, come on, man, and you see the individuals and the way they operate in the spaces, it's high level, it's high class, it's world class. And for those of you who would have visited the Cardiff Hotel down in Runaway Bay, that is where we do the training. Yes, an entire hotel dedicated to training individuals so that we can not only supply the Jamaican labor force, but internationally. Dr. Dyer will tell you, Doc, I can't keep them. As soon as I train them, the entire world just gobbled them up. That is how good they are at what they do. Then there's the construction. The information technology and agriculture, among others. So some heart initiatives aimed at bridging soft, hard, and digital skills gaps of Jamaicans. And of course, there is the, I'm coming to you, Bent, I'm coming to you. And if we look at this slide, we would see Chef Lumley. Everybody knows Chef Lumley, right? No, you can't pay Chef Lumley, you know. You can't, you know, we're telling the people, Dr. Gardner, they can't do food and nutrition because they're not bright, right? And you cannot pay Chef Lumley. And when we go to the fancy restaurant in, in um, Kingston, they have a new one now, um, some Thai one. I'm not sure you went to the, go, go to the Thai, the new, oh, you don't go yet. All right, there's a new one man up there. And you can hardly pay for this kind of food, this kind of cuisine. And yet still, they are steering people away. Come, come, we need to wake up where this is concerned. So we are a significant partner in enabling employment. Unemployment reached a record low of 7.1% in October 2020. There, because we're finding now that we're not suffering, Dr. Gardner, again, from unemployment. We're suffering from underemployment. So we have some people that just don't want to work. They just want to work. 
So it is not that the work not there. They just don't want no work. And they want to wake up one o'clock. And they want to sit down and they go their hand miggle. And when you pull them into work, they have, have all kinds of excuses. But we have Ronik here, who is in community engagement, where we are going out there to take up every one of them off street corner that is digging out their hand middle every last one because we have to ensure that we fulfill this mandate and that we equip them with a productivity mindset that is where we want to start so almost all 98.6 percent of the training programs in heart are aligned to the labor market needs so if you're talking about the car industry we have jack and if you want to get your car service, it's trainees down there doing it. If you're talking about the hospitality industry where we're training the front desk, the receptionists, the individuals in the restaurant area, we have um, um, Dr. Dyer's place up there, Cardiff. If you're talking about beauty industry, we have Sal Ten. If you're talking about shoemaking, we have Leap Center. Right? If you're talking about agriculture, we have Ebony Park. If you're talking about tools and engineering, we have AI. And if you're talking about the high level technological system, we're going to hear from Bent a little bit from here. So everything is there. We have the enhanced job readiness curriculum. We have the digital literacy tech campaign. So team, in closing or bridging the skills gap, it is crucial for accelerating human development. And that is why the trust would have invested in all of these institutions so that this thing, Mr. Michael, becomes institutionalized. See Mr. Michael there with his camera? That is Steve Ed. And Mr. Michael will tell you that he doesn't have to wake up Dr. Garden to go to no work at 8 o'clock because him just sit on and wait on a phone call for a conference of this nature. And there are many of this nature. And he will come. And I am sure that Mr. Michael is very well banked. Right, Mr. Michael? And that is Steve Ed. The camera, the camera in his hand is Steve Ed. So no matter how much iPhone 13 Pro Max that we have, we cannot get rid of the competency that is nestled in a Michael right there. We can't. Because we have the weddings, we have the weddings, them not go to style. We have the funerals, them worse than go to style, right? And so we're always gonna have need for that kind of competence. And so team, I, I really want to take this opportunity now to, and I'll just speak quickly Mark, because I don't want um, Mr. Mr. Marlon to crucify me. The, the business development support that we offer in the trust. So let me just tell you about this. We offer business development support to micro, small, and medium enterprises. So we literally give you a million dollars to start up your business, right, Mr. Marlon? So if it is that you're out there, you have a business idea, you want to advance it, you don't know what to do, you come to the trust. We don't only give you the money because that don't make any sense. We take you through developing the business plan. We handhold you through your marketing and communication techniques that you need to advance this work. And then we follow you, we track you. Just the other day, the JMEA had a big conference and we had people in that particular conference who got support from heart years ago to start their business so that they could now be on display and so we are fueling the entrepreneurship piece of the individuals so in bridging the skills gap come bent is your time it is crucial for accelerating human development and so we're going to get into the other piece of the argument dr garden because you see we talk about the cosmetology we talk about the automotive industry we talk about the construction but there's another piece to this thing that we're missing the big piece is digitalization greening and innovation and that is what mr bent is going to be taking us through right now over to you mr bent Thanks. Thanks, Dr.
All right, thank you so much, Dr. Engleton. Good, af good morning or afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. All right, I'm standing on tall shoulders this morning, Dr. Engleton. Excellent presentation. You have been so kind. All right, so here we are. The blueprint of excellence is right there, as you can see it. And I want you to focus on what we call the vertical and horizontal model, right? It is driven by the horizontal pillars, and of course, the output is our greening, digitization, and innovation. Everything you do from now on must have some level of integration with greening, digitization, and that brings about innovation. TVET is all about innovation. And that is why we are at the fourth industrial revolution, right? It started from, from 17, you can skip that one, Doc. It started from 1765 and up to June 30, 2019, the fourth industrial revolution was discovered. It's important to go back in history because there's a saying that nothing is the past as important as what will happen in the future. But if an earthquake starts to shake, now everybody will and I wonder if the foundation was strong enough. Right? Very good. So we are building on that foundation, the technologies, and putting it into our systems to impact the fourth industrial revolution. Now, pay attention to this slide. What it's all about, it's the interconnectedness of the physical and the digital worlds. Right? And on the screen, it shows how the industry operates. Back in the 70s and the 80s, what used to happen, you have industrialization started with steam, and then you used to have people, they're nine to five. And then it move on to electricity. And then you have industrialization where motors, conveyor systems producing in mass amount. And that gave rise to the demand of a number of skills that never existed anywhere. Companies such as Alpart in St. Elizabeth, when they started operation, the people in the community couldn't get any work because they did not have the skill. And that brought about the existence and the building of the now Derricochester campus in Junction because there was a need to train the people so they could benefit from the jobs. That need still exists today broadly in Jamaica because there are many skill sets, as you can see on the screen, that you sitting here don't have for this fourth industrial revolution. And the thing about the fourth industrial revolution is not the students, it's not the workers, it's all of us that needs these skill sets. Everything that is there can be operated from your cell phone. Do you understand the apps and the features that can turn on and turn off and open and close your gate system from sitting here? Do you all have that on your phone? This is what the tech... I hear somebody say yes, thumbs up. That's what the technology is all about. Can you operate your business place, a machine, from a distance? Can you go on it and monitor? Can, do you understand the matrix developed by these physical features and technological features? That's what we are about. The cause and effects. Of course, we are now into mass production, and we are going to what is called jobless growth. We are producing more, we are earning more, but we don't need as many jobs. But all is not lost, because persons who are ascribed and aligned and, and of course, embrace the fourth industrial revolution will have multiple careers. No one nine to five anymore. Everybody can start a business, and they don't need time to do this. The only thing they will need is sleep. Because any time of the night you are connected to the world and you can carry out jobs performance in different countries from anywhere you are in the world. That's what the fourth industrial revolution is all about. So we are fully automated and we are moving faster. Now, everything has identity. And your identity is your DNA. For a long time you thought it was your birth certificate and your address and all of that. No longer. Your identity is your DNA. And so too, are the fourth industrial revolution, machines and equipment. So these concepts and elements, so you see, are the elements of the 4.0. You have to understand them because if you operate machines, you buy a fridge, you buy a washing machine at home, all of these things are connected. The e-vehicles, everything that goes digitization, carry these elements and you have to understand them or else you'll have to contract me every day and you'll have to pay me every day to come and reset the features, come and show you how to operate the technology, whether it's in your business, your school, or your home. Things such as cyber physical systems. These are what enable you to connect machine to machine, machine to computer, man to machine, all of those things, right? RFID, radio frequency identification. If you have an e-vehicle 
and you don't know your RFID, you cannot charge when you go to the charging port because you have to put in that information. And if you lose it, God help you. Near field communication. If you are in a technological base and there are simil similar technological equipment, people can swipe or move or share information simply because you have a device. So don't be perturbed when you see Mission Impossible and James Bond movie and you see they just shift information and you wonder how that work. It's called near field communication. So when you go into an industrialized environment, you have to understand that. Here at the heart in the state trust, we have machines in place. We have just established centers of excellence where our mechatronics machine and our PLC machines are communicating with each other and sharing information such as that, right? We also have machine-to-machine -machine communication, M2M, and MMM machine-to-machine -machine interaction, and of course, machine-robot collaboration. These are cyber-physical systems that we are now inputting in our training programs, all our industrialized programs here at heart. And we are working with international providers and collaborators to ensure that this technology is what the future requires of us now. We cannot wait until we get in the future to start preparing for the future. We are doing that now. And we are joining forces, industries, and other training agencies. And of course, very popular and what you need to know, pick by light and put by light and plug and produce. These are what make up what we call smart factories. No longer you have to have a 4,000 or 40,000 square foot factory. You can have a 1,000 square foot put a machine inside there, and the output is just as impactful, if not greater, using this technology. And what it does is that it keeps in check the quality checks. You don't need inspectors anymore. Plug and produce simply means if something fall out of line, it brings it back in line and recalibrate the system, and not the machine does not have to stop any at all. And of course, the future of work will be impacted. On the screen, it tells you the percentage by which they will be impacted by automation. So you have to get in line yeah, or start your own business. Food and food preparation, 60% impact. Construction, about 58%. Driving and so on, about 56 And then you have agricultural labor, just over 50%. Because agriculture is one of the drivers of economic development. Agriculture and manufacturing is two things that we need to embrace holistically. Because when we, when, you can clap, man, because we are so advantaged. Sorry, Kevin, but you can't put me up here and give me 10 minutes. I'm not that measure of a man. All right? <laughs> um, yes. Um, <laughs> he's my friend. Information technology, it ties everything together, right? The whole networks is very important how we transmit information. No flow is moving out all your systems to fiber optics. It simply means that if your house, you normally have a 20 M MPS, you are now getting 200. So you are able to move things across and share information. Of course, and that, that mentioned all of those fine um, soft skills that will be fine-tuning the future of work quite well. But a quick example. Um, it took 75 years for 100 million people to get the telephone in their homes, right? Pokemon Go, up to 2016, hooked that many users in only one month. In one month, everybody was connected on Pokemon Go. So it tells you how the technology can really move things, right? Um, the machines that we are bringing about are machines that will help to shape how the youths of today view TVET. It is said that within the first three years of the child mind, their matrix of the mind is developed, how their thought process will operate, what they will respond to, whether the world of work and socialization. And these are the technologies that their brain only can respond to. And so we have to move ahead and get these technologies implemented. Ladies and gentlemen, the heart trust is on the move to ensure that we implement these technologies and fill the skills gaps that are required and advance Jamaica into the future and build a resilient economy. This is one of our labs that we just existed, um, created, and that's our mechatronics lab at our center of excellence in the hub of Junction St. Elizabeth there. And um, that's the design. And so we also use it as a multi-purpose. We do electronics, we do optoelectronics, robo robotics, and mechatronics using one lab space. And the size there you can see is fitted in a 800 square feet building. As simple as that, all right? And of course, this is what our welding labs coming in the future looking like so that we can 
move the youths and get them impacted into these industries. That's where we are going, ladies and gentlemen. Additive manufacturing and so on. Thank you so much, Mr. Baxter, for, <laughs> for being. And these are some of the industries in Jamaica that are currently using these technologies. So it is not a, a theory. It's practical. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you.